Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Sue Campbell and Dr. Amy Beacom about improving organizational policy and practice around parental leave. Campbell and Dr. Amy Beacom, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're both joining me from Portland, Oregon. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And it was really fun just chatting with you in the pre-interview and getting to know you a little bit. Of course, I'm from Salem, Oregon, um, and I love the Portland area. And I often wish I could go back to the Pacific Northwest. (laughs) I've been in Utah for a long time. I love Utah. It's beautiful. Uh, But it was quite crisp this morning. And uh, sometimes I, I do long for the Pacific Northwest days. It is a beautiful, beautiful place. Well, we're not going to be talking about Portland today. Uh, What we are going to be talking about is improving organizational policy and practice around parental leave. And both of you uh, are authors of a new book. We're going to be exploring that together, all about parental leave and how we can do this more effectively and why it's important, really, uh, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our people and treating people humanely and, and as human beings I think that's essential, but also how it affects the bottom line of the organization, how it can be a a net positive across the board. Uh, So this this is what we're going to be unpacking and exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Sue and Amy's bios with everybody. Sue Campbell is a writer, author, and coach who has worked with the Center for Parental Leave Leadership since its early days, helping to communicate the transformative impact of their core mission. Her writing often focuses on issues important to parents has been published in many outlets, including Prevention, Good Housekeeping, Scary Mom, and Mama Love. Dr. Amy Beacom is the founder and CEO of the Center for Parental Leave Leadership, the first full service consultancy in the U.S. to focus exclusively on parental leave. She conceived of and began developing the field of parental leave coaching and consulting in 2006. Drawing on over 25 years in executive leadership development and coaching, Amy consults with Fortune 100 companies, international organizations, working parents, and more to transform the way our companies and our country engage with the parental leave transition. Amy is also the co-author of the Parental Leave Playbook, 10 Touch Points to Transition Smoothly, Strengthen Your Family, and Continue Building Your Career. Uh, Wonderful, wonderful background both of you bring to the table. It's a pleasure to be with you. Anything else that you would like to share with me or my listeners by way of your background, your personal story, before we launch on into the topic for today? We're both parents. (laughs) <laughs> that, 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 yeah that if makes you, sense if you didn't guess <laughs> we're both parents and before working with amy i actually had a background in hr as well oh wonderful and i i love hr of course um <laughs> uh we we have lots of overlaps and since you both are parents if you wouldn't mind sharing you know i listeners of the podcast know i have six children um they they keep my days lively and adventurous um, <laughs> uh, ages eight to 18 are my children. How about for both Fantastic. of you? Um, we actually met when our oldest, which are both four, 15, um, started first grade together. So, uh, they are 15. And then I have, this is Amy talking. I have also a 12 year old and Sue has, how old's Alma now? A seven year old. Seven. Yes. 
Yeah, well, that's wonderful. I families are so important. Of course, that's a, a crux of the the conversation today. Um, one thing I thought I would also just note uh, is this this discussion around parental leave is a newish conversation, isn't it? Um, maternity leave has been around for a long time. Um, but at least in my circles, I haven't heard lots of people really talking about parental leave outside of maternity leave until just maybe the last five years, maybe the last decade. Uh, but it hasn't been super prevalent. Uh, and I, I have six children, but there was no talk at my university mm -hmm. about parental leave before mm -hmm. any of my children were born. I never had any sort of yeah. leave <laughs> available well, to me um, from the university <laughs> when I had any of my six children. Now, fortunately, I, you know, I'm a professor. It's a pretty flexible job with a lot of autonomy. So it was fine. Like I was able to work it out and, and be home mostly and, and help out with everything. Um, and so that worked out for me, but you know, that's, that's yeah. it, the world has changed quite a bit though. And now my university has comprehensive parental leave policies. And so it has made positive steps. Um, but yeah, yeah that, you know, it's, it's a, a, a yeah. quickly changing kind of world. that we're Yeah. In it's very interesting. So I, I began this when I had my first son 15 years ago. And back then I was in, I was finishing my doctorate. I was, um, doing executive leadership consulting and um, a lot of women's leadership advancement kind of work. And, and you're exactly right. There was nothing, right? They, there was maternity leave and it was unpaid usually. And women would go away and they would have a child. There wasn't, a, you know, nothing was discussed about adoption or different types of families or anything like that. And they would come back and they were exposed, you know, they're expected to fit right back in where they left. And at, because I had just finished um, co-creating the first curriculum at Columbia around executive coaching, I had coaching on my mind while I was pregnant and I was consulting in New York to these companies around women's advancement and how do we retain women and you know, all these different things. And then I had a child and realized that we were overlooking the most important moment in a personal and professional life cycle that we could around transition, around retention, around um, enhancing that relationship with that employee, as well as their skills and abilities. And so I shifted the focus of my research and my work from executive leadership and coaching to create a field that at the time, to your point, I was calling maternity leave coaching. <laughs> so um, it was only, I began the Center for Parental Leave Leadership um, eight almost nine years ago. And I was real, the, the point of that was to really start shifting our conversation from that sole maternity leave focus that made it a woman's issue to fix to this idea that parental leave is a gender neutral opportunity for our companies and our country to embrace and learn from. Um, and we haven't looked back. It's been moving ever since, but it is only in these last couple of years, especially during the pandemic, that the conversation has really turned up the volume. Yeah. Anything to add there by way of background, Sue? Well, one of the things that really struck me when Amy and I began working together was her emphasis on dads as well. And my husband stayed home for, you know, at least a month when each of our children were born. And that was fantastic. It was absolutely invaluable. But part of me, like this is my personal evolution on the topic, was like, can we just fix this for the women first, please? Like, we're the ones who have been impacted for the longest. <laughs> And what I really came to realize uh, and what became clear is until we enable men to be just as likely uh, to leave as caregivers, as women, right? We will always be subtly penalizing women and thinking, oh, well, I would love to give her the promotion. She's amazing, but I'm worried she's gonna go out and have another kid and there's gonna be this huge gap in coverage for that position. When men are just as likely to take a caregiving leave, that won't happen anymore. That won't be part of the sort of subconscious bias that's still happening today. Yeah, that's sad. <laughs> that that's the way we have to approach it, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that and kind it's of, that, wonderful. It's wonderful for dads to be home during this pivotal time it, as well. I don't want to yeah. undervalue that, as you know. Like it, 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 it has long-term impacts on both dad, mom, and child when dad yeah. is able to take time off during that critical time. Yeah. And there really are so many great examples of this around the world, 
where they really honor the role of parenthood and they encourage parental leave. Uh, and I, I imagine you could talk all about that as yeah. well. Uh, and, and so even if we can adopt even just a, a fraction <laughs> of that, that's being done in, in say some of the Nordic countries, for example, you know, we'd, we'd have tremendous, uh, we'd shift that culture very, very quickly. And it, it would be so lovely to see that. It is sad yeah. that we, ha- we have to, we have to make things better for quote unquote, better for men first, before we can think about making things more uh, equitable for women. That, that, that's frustrating. Um, uh, but and there's you, something you said there that I just want to tag on to, because I, I think so often we, as a country, we look to these other countries and think they're doing it so much better and what, and in many, many ways they are obviously around paid leave. They are around policy, around some of the gender neutral um, policies they are. But what we've learned over time is how much better we do some of the things in this country and how little um, that's known. So for example, when I first started this work, the model that I created, I was asked to come to Australia where they had just um, started the first gender reporting laws where they had to report how many women in leadership, what positions they were, how much they were being paid publicly. And so the companies were all freaking out like, oh my gosh, we, everybody's falling out around parental leave, what do we do? And so we brought the, the maternity leave coaching program over there to pilot it. And what we found that although their policies were better, their practice was not. And so a lot, because my background is in organizational psychology and, and the work side of how you do this well, um, where we really want to shift thinking within organizations is that yes, the policy is foundational and critical to what you do, but it is really in the practice that that comes alive and helps your culture within your organization and where the learning opportunities exist. So um, what that looks like in other countries is usually just as bad. (laughs) Mm. Um, So I just think- So actual, yeah, that's, well, that's helpful. Actual implementation Mm-hmm. Uh, it is challenging, isn't it? And yeah. uh, whether we're talking about here domestically in the U.S. or abroad, uh, that's, that's always right. going to be a challenge. Uh, very, very important point there. So as we really start to dig into this, um, let's let's start to lay out some very specific things that companies can do to improve their policy first uh, to lay that foundation, mm-hmm. and then move move into practice around mm-hmm. parental leave? Um, I would start and Sue, jump in anywhere you want. They, with policy, the first thing to think about is what you're wanting to communicate. It's like anything else within your organization. Are you, um, are you wanting to be seen as a more progressive organization that's understanding the issues facing working families today? Then you need a gender neutral policy. You need a minimum of 12 weeks paid. You need, and I say minimum, that's not a maximum. (laughs) Um, You um, need it to be gender neutral and to be inclusive of all types of families, no matter how someone becomes a family, forms their family or becomes a parent. So that means not just birth. Um, And so those, those are some basic floors for a good policy, but then it's about how do you enact that policy? How do you train your managers? How do you coach and support your new parents so that they really have an aligned training in what this culture shift means within your organization? Because um, most companies, they may have a policy, but they're, they're just, <laughs> like I said, they're just not really doing much about that. It's complicated for people to navigate. They don't know where to go. The managers haven't been trained in it. And it ends up having the opposite effect of what the policy was put in place to do. It frustrates people. It makes them feel like they don't matter. It makes them feel like their needs aren't being met. And they get angry at the most important time in their life when they need to be shown support. And they leave. Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen Organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, The Future Leader 
will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy, courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. So there's bottom line. One way I hear what you're saying is an acknowledgement and perhaps it's important within a business setting to to focus on, you know, the the dollars and cents, bottom line, business case arguments for Mm -hmm. why this is important. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that is important. And and when people, when people leave, uh, it's a problem and it's yeah. expensive, uh, but there's also the human case and, you know, it's just doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do and it's the right way to treat people and treat people as human beings. So, and, and those don't need to be mutually exclusive either. Like they, they can and should go together. And so we need to always be looking to, to better communicate those for anyone who may be hesitant or on the bubble about yeah. like his parental thing for uh, is parental leave for us in our organization. Uh, hopefully we can make it as crystal clear as possible for them that yes, yeah. it is for you. It's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit your people. It's going to help everyone be more productive and successful in the long run. And ultimately, you know, that's, that's what everyone wants. And, yeah. and just because we're, we're doing something a little bit differently than maybe people have experienced in the past, uh, doesn't mean it's bad. And in fact, in, in the future of work, this is going to be more no and more brainer. important. It's a no, it's a no <laughs> brainer. Absolutely. It's a no brainer. Um, yeah. I think for those in your listeners who are a little more progressive than others um, or forward thinking to even move beyond talking about parental leave, we, we see parental leave as a wonderful entry point, but it's only an entry point. We focus on this time frame specifically because it's the most common transitional experience that most employees will go through at some point in their career. And so it's an opportunity to learn a number of behaviors that will take you far, far, far into your career. Um, But this moment about parental leave that we're focused on right now as a country, we are going to be shifting into a conversation around family leave. Because what happens as soon as you bring in parental leave, then other people are like, well, I don't have a baby, I have a dog, or I have cancer, or I have a, a loved one that needs caregiving, right? And so if you are an organization that really wants to get into this space, it's talking about family leave instead of just parental leave. And that's where our policy is heading as well. So we have nine states plus DC that have family leave policies on the books in the state. And that's what we were looking at um, that as part of the Build Back Better Act was the first time that we would have had that at a federal level, but that is not happening right now. Um, And I just, in case your listeners don't know, we are the only country, the only wealthy, the only industrialized nation in the world that does not have a federal paid leave policy. And unfortunately, what people, what organizations usually don't understand is that that lack of policy means that all of this falls on the burden of the organization and it shouldn't. This is a a societal issue to fix, not an organizational issue to fix. And until we do that, it will continue to. The expense and the figuring out how to make it work um, across 
multi-state employer. I mean, it gets exceptionally complicated. Um, so that's where we come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's not let's not forget that we have all of these areas that are protected under FMLA. Mm -hmm. um, there's just no get, there's no pay component to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's job protection, and it's, it only covers fifty six percent of our employees. And exactly. yeah, FMLA don't, doesn't cover doesn't cover everyone either. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, so for, you know, oftentimes I'll talk to people and they're like, no, 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 there's federal protection for this. And they'll point to <laughs> no, FMLA no, no, and I'm no. like, oh, you don't actually understand FMLA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another stat that I find shocking is that in our country, 25% of uh, women giving birth go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. They're forced back. So if you think about that, like that, that's a two week old baby going to daycare, being left with someone that's a healing mother. You don't want that person in your job site, right? That is not someone that is a good risk management decision to have around. Yeah. 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 Excellent. And sorry, Sue, I cut you off just a minute ago. That's what I was just saying this, this conversation about, you know, nine States and DC, or are we going to get a federal policy? Um, Amy's very future thinking. So it's like the writing is on the wall. We're going to have either state level policies or a federal policy. When that happens, employers need to think, okay, well, how am I going to stand out? How am I going to attract new talent? And that's where your practice comes in. Maybe you're adding extra generosity on top of whatever policy ends up happening. Great. But what's really going to differentiate employers is how well they handle it in practice how well their parents feel coming out of leave. Was it a good experience? Was it a positive thing? Do they feel like they were you know, really encouraged or better yet required to take all of their leave, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that is what is gonna set employers apart. So if you really wanna look ahead and get in front of this, you're looking at practice, not just policy. Yeah, and I like how you said requiring them to take the leave <laughs> because we know in the United States, our culture around leave is terrible. Um, yes. You know, we people like companies now are offering unlimited PTO. In theory, that sounds fantastic. In reality, right. it's terrible because yeah. the culture is you have this, take it when you need it. Oh, but if you take it, but don't you know, take it. <laughs> don't, don't actually take it because then it's going to hurt your career progression. Um, you're going to be seen as less committed to your job and to the company. And by the way, none of the executives are taking their leave or their time <laughs> yeah. off. And so, I mean, that's the reality. So we can, we can make this policy and say, everyone, you know, now you have this available, but who's actually going to take it if they don't see any of their leaders or executives modeling that behavior. Um, most people won't take it. Uh, any ambitious career driven individual is not going to take that full amount of leave. And that's mm -hmm. not the situation we want to be in. So requiring it saying, here is the leave. Here are the, the situations where you can take this leave. You are required to take this leave. Go enjoy your child. <laughs> yep. and, well, you're and, required and, to take this leave and here's how to do it. Here's how we yes. can support you. And here's how you return. And this is the process. So it is standardized. We aren't reinventing the wheel. It just becomes the way things are done. And it is smooth and easy. Like that. And if it's not standardized, inevitably, you're going to end up with inequities, right? Exactly. Yep. And, and, and you're going to have people re-entering. That, that is one of the, the points that is really important to, to hone in on here is mm -hmm. the re-entry is yeah. really complicated for people who choose to take leave now, whether it's just FMLA non-paid leave and mm -hmm. they return, or maybe okay. you have a, a generous company who on their, of their own accord, they're, they're offering um, parental leave. When people come back into the workplace, what is that experience like? And for most, it's not great. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so finding a way to standardize that and just make it clear across the, the board what that's going to be like it takes away all of those biases of that, yeah. that ends up just in, whether it's my intention or not to treat, you know, say a woman who takes parental leave and a man who takes parental leave differently, or someone who takes two weeks versus two, three months of leave, you know, whether it's my intention or not to treat them differently, guess what? I have bias. I'm going to end up treating them differently unless there are systems in place to ensure that I don't. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what we've, what I have 
researched and honed and studied and done for 15 years is find out what those are. So it is not something that companies need to figure out. It is already figured out. <laughs> there, this is it. And we have the, the answers. Um, the, what I get most upset about is when a company calls us to say, hey, we're, we're wanting to do some coaching. I shouldn't get upset about it. I'm happy they call us to do, you know, to do anything. But where I want them to be thinking to call is at the very beginning when they're just getting into this. We, we know the pitfalls. We know the places that things are going to have an unintentional effect when something is coming out of a place of good. You know, To think about how this is really a systemic solution. It's not just the policy. It's manager training. It's coaching. It's getting the right resources, the right processes in place. And having all of that just be the way that you do it at your company and have that information and that education and training roll out to your managers and your HR and your new parents. And then you're done with it. It becomes your culture and that's just what it is. Okay. And it doesn't yes. have to be a big deal. It sounds like, oh, we got to train everybody. Oh, dear God. Right. <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, we've got a series of manager videos where they're each like two minutes each and they walk you through <laughs> all of the 10 touch points and you get a checklist and boom, you are better than 99% of the organizations <laughs> in the US, right? It doesn't have to be a heavy lift, but it makes all the difference in the world in retaining those parents. Yeah. Well, and Sue, that was my next question was, why is it important that we train managers on how to handle this? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it certainly is important if you have any policy or practice, any system in place, you need to make sure people understand how to use it, how to do it consistently, right? Otherwise you run into problems. Um, But people do start to get hung up on, oh my gosh, there's all this training and that can be so difficult. And you just articulate it. Actually, it's not that hard. (laughs) It's not that hard. Well, Um, and this was one of the things I'll, I'll hand it to you in a second, Amy, but one of the other things that attracted me to working with Amy is because we don't have a federal policy. She understood that all of the power is with the employer to improve this experience and it's to their benefit to do it. And the way that you do that, right? I, I don't remember the exact precise number, but most of the people who leave their jobs leave their jobs because they don't like their manager, (laughs) right? Um, So if you empower that manager to understand not just how to support the leave, but why it's to their benefit to support the leave. And what will come from them supporting the leave. Exactly. What the result of that will be, it becomes really a no brainer. And the manager in that organization is the one who has the highest touch with that employee and can make the biggest difference in whether that leave is perceived as a positive experience or a negative experience. And what you're doing in the manager training is you're also teaching them family supportive supervisory behaviors, which 10 years of research has honed in are the reason that people will stay within their organization if they have their manager enacting these behaviors. And um, we teach them through to leave. It's a, a, an action learning program, basically, right? Like it's your best experiential learning program and it's already on the books. It's already happening. You're you know, already paying for it. It's seize it. It's your most overlooked leadership development opportunity. Well, I love it. Amy and Sue, this has just been a fascinating conversation. <laughs> so much to take away. Uh, you know, on the one hand, it's really not rocket science. It sounds like it's pretty straightforward. Most people, most the organizations, other, nobody thinks about it, right? They're not doing it well. So yeah. there, there's a lot of opportunity here to imp- significantly improve <laughs> the lives of your people, uh, their families, and the sustainability of your organization from a people mm-hmm. perspective. So it's a no brainer. Let's let's just get on it and start moving uh, the needle. Uh, and we can do that very quickly if we just start paying attention to this. Uh, Amy and Sue, it's been a pleasure. Before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. So you can reach us at CPL Leadership for Center for Parental Leave Leadership.com. Um, If you want to just reach out uh, via email, just email info at cplleadership.com. Definitely pick up the parental leave playbook, not just for your employees, but for the managers. Same 10 touch points, right? They'll give your managers will gain tremendous empathy by learning those touch points from the employee side of things. Um, And yeah, I, 
I agree with the summary that you said, John, where, look, we can move the needle on this really quickly. We know how to do it. Um, and you will be so glad that you did. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Amy and Sue can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.